In this short set of lectures, we are going to quickly discuss the basics of digital electronics. Now, as you all know, digital electronics deals with a branch of mathematics, which is called Boolean algebra. Now, Boolean algebra really is an algebra by which we describe logical statements. It's really the algebra of logic. Now, in this, we deal with statements that are either true or false. So, statements in Boolean algebra have to be things which fall into precise categories. They can be either true or false. No such thing as perhaps or in between is allowed. At least not in classical Boolean algebra. The values of these statements are denoted by T or F, true or false, often by 1 or 0. So, it's typically the norm that we use 1 for true and 0 for false. Although that does not necessarily mean that uh, in an electronic circuit, 0 is always represented by 0 volts, as we will see. And, well, there are other ways of denoting them. For example, some other people, especially those from electronics background, might write this as H and L for high and low, respectively. Anyway, the point is, the statements that we deal with in Boolean algebra can have either one of these two values. So basically, we are essentially talking about a space in which you have multiple number of variables and each of these variables can take values either 0 or 1. Now, there are certain operations you can do with statements. One of the simplest ones is NOT. If a statement A is true, then not A, which you denote by a bar on top like this, is actually false. Well, it sort of follows from the standard English meaning of the word. If A is true, then not A is false. And if A is false, not A is true. If you have two statements A and B, both Boolean statements, which means they can be either true or false, then you can form the compound statement A and B which we often denote just by writing A and B next to each other without the AND written in between. Sometimes we put a dot in between just to emphasize that something is going on between them. AB is true if and only if both A is true and B is true. So this is what AND means. And that again follows standard English logic or logic of any language. That is, if you say something like, it's going to rain tomorrow, well, that is not really a Boolean statement because it can be either, either true or false or maybe something probabilistic. But if you say something like, it rained yesterday, if that's either true or false. And you also say, I got wet yesterday. That can also be true or false. Now, it rained yesterday and I got wet yesterday. That will happen only if both it rained yesterday and you went outside without an umbrella. Of course, if either of these two statements is false, that is maybe it did not rain yesterday or maybe you did not go outside at all. Getting wet under the shower doesn't really count here. Then, a and B, in this case, would be false. So, for a statement to be true, both A and B have to be true. For A and B, A and B to be true. Both A has to be true and B has to be true. For it to be false, any one of the statements can be false. The other way of forming a compound statement out of two is uh, the statement A or B, which we often denote by A plus B, where the plus sign here, of course, does not mean addition at all. It's just a symbol standing in for the OR operation. This binary operation OR, what it does is that it returns a value true if, well, either A is true or B is true or both are true. So this is where there is a slight dichotomy between the way we use the word OR in Boolean algebra and the way we use the OR sometimes in English. This example of OR is what is called an inclusive OR. This is true if both A is true 
and b is true. It's also true if a is true, b is false, b is true, a is false. But both are true is included. That's why it's called an inclusive. Or the only way this can be false is if both statements are false. There is another sense in which the word or is used in the English language. That's an exclusive or sense. If I say something like, you will score 40% in the exam or you will fail. Well, here it's pretty clear that what we mean is the exclusive or. If you both manage to get more than 40% in the exam and you failed, well, that would be pretty bad, right? So that or there is an exclusive or. Either this is true or this is true, but not both. But the standard or the one which we use in Boolean algebra is called, is the inclusive or. Okay, so these things are often shown or demonstrated by something called truth table. Truth tables basically list the values of a and b, the variables which go into an expression and the result of the functions. The reason why they are called truth tables simply because what goes in the table are true or false values. Of course, you may write them using zeros and ones, but they are still true and false values. So this is what the table really looks like. Let me quickly go through this. A and B, of course, can have two values each. That means taken together, they can have two times two, that is four values. And it's the convention, and it's a very useful convention, to write these four possibilities in order. The order here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, the order that you see here, that basically is the order in which you would write down numbers if you were to express them in binary. Remember, 0, 0 in binary, of course, is 0. 0, 1 is 1, 1, 0 is 2 in our standard decimal way of thinking of things and 1, 1 is 3. So this is really the number 0, 1, 2, 3 in that order. The one reason why we do this is that it's convenient and it's also easy to check whether you have missed out one of the possible combinations. Of course, with only two Boolean variables, there are only four combinations. So not really very really likely that you would miss out on them, but uh, you may... And you will soon have to deal with many more variables. And there it's useful to keep this convention in mind so that you are sure that you have got all the numbers. Okay, not A in this column is very straightforward. It's just the opposite of what A is. So if wherever A is 0, you get 1s. Wherever A is 1, you have 0. Of course, for, to express just not A, you wouldn't have needed a four row thing because after all, one single variable can take only two values, 0 and 1. Not A would have 1 and 0 in their place. Similarly, not B. But this is useful because we can go ahead and show something else here. But A and B, notice that is 1 only if both A and B are 1, not otherwise. A or B, on the other hand, is 1, well, in almost all cases, is 0 only when A and B are both 0, that is, both false. Two other useful operations, which are not, well, not necessarily in the same category as the previous ones, but they are useful all the same, is A and B. NAND B is not AND, so you form the form A and B first and then we are not, which of course means all the zeros here get inverted and you get 1, 1, 1, 0. And A nor B, which is 1, 0, 0, 0. That is, A nor B is true only when both are false and 0 every time else. So this is very important point to note about the NAND and the NOR. For the NAND, you can get a 0 output only if both inputs are 1. Otherwise, you are always going to get a 1 output. So, whenever any one input is 0, you are going to get 1 as an output with NAND. With NOR, on the other hand, whenever any one of the inputs is 1, you are bound to get a 0. The only way you can get something else, that is a 1, is with if both the inputs are 0. And one more very easy thing to check would be, what happens if I took the data in this column, these two columns, A bar and B bar, and did AND and OR on them. Let's quickly do that. If I did an AND on A bar and B bar, what will I get? 
let me just try writing this on the side. 1, 1, of course, will give me 1. I'm doing and, remember, between A bar and B bar. Uh, 1, 0 will give me 0. This will give me 0. This will give me 0. So, if I did A bar and B bar, I will get 1, 0, 0, 0, which, notice, is exactly the same as A plus B whole bar. So, A nor B can also be thought of as not A and not B. If, on the other hand, if I did A bar or B bar, then I will get 1 here, 1 here, 1 here, and 0 only here, because both are zeros in that case. And once again, if you compare, you can see that A bar or B bar is the same as A and B whole bar. So, basically, this is again something you can easily figure out from basic logic. When is A and B true? A and B true means A and B is false. And that can happen either when A is false or B is false. Or both. Which means, this is what, what is going to happen. Either when A is false, which means A bar is true, or B bar is true, or both. So this is how you get this column. Similarly, you can argue about why A nor B is the same as not A and not B. That is for A nor B to be true, A or B to be false, the only way that can happen is both A is false and B is false. And these two equations are very, very important. These relations are called De Morgan's laws. They are used extensively in Boolean algebra, especially to simplify Boolean expressions. And let me just repeat them once again. A and B whole bar, which is A and B, is not A or not B. So notice and and or gets reversed. A or B whole bar is again reversal of and and or here not A and not B. So here you had an OR which you have complemented. Here you complement first and then do an AND. And some other Boolean algebra laws which are very very useful is since you can see here if one of the inputs in an OR is 0 that is one of them is low then the value of course depends on whatever the other one is. That is high if A is high low if a is low. So a or 0 is a. By the way, I'm going to say or or plus interchangeably. It's really or, but the habit, old habits die hard and calling this plus is very tempting. Similarly, I will I might often say this is into, whereas this is really and. Anyway, a and 0. If one of the statements is 0 in a and expression, then the output has to be 0. So a plus 0 is a, a dot 0 is 0. Now, these two sort of look exactly like ordinary algebra rules, right? If you added 0 to a number, you would get the number back. If you multiplied the number by 0, you would get 0. But remember, these is not addition. The plus is not addition. Dot is not multiplication. This is just a, well, coincidence that they, these two equations look exactly the same as ordinary algebra equations. And you can see that Immediately in the, on the next line, a and 1 is a. Why? Because if one of the statements is true, then the and of that with a is going to be true if and only if a is true. If a is true, both are true, then you get 1. If a is false, 1 is true, a is false, so result is false, which is the same as a. So this again looks like an ordinary algebra equation. Well, look at this one a plus a1 equals 1. What does this tell you? It tells you that if one of the two statements is true, it does not matter what the other one is. The result has to be true. One important point about these rules, which are going to be very useful when we try thinking about Boolean circuits, is that if one of the inputs in an AND is 0, the output is bound to be 0, if one of the inputs in a NAND is 0, then the output is bound to be 1, simply because it's going to be the complement of this. In the very similar fashion, if one of the inputs to an OR gate, to an OR function, is 1, the output has to be 1. And 
exactly along these lines. If one of the inputs to a node is 1, the output has to be 0. Our final set of Boolean algebra rules deals with what happens when you combine a statement with its complement. If you or A and A bar, well, what are you really saying? You are saying either A is true or A bar is true, which is the same thing as saying either A is true or A is false. Now, that is something which has to be true, right? If you say something is it's going to rain today and it's not going to rain today. Well, if you use an and, that's the other thing. But if you use or, you said it's going to rain today or it's not going to rain today. That's a statement which has no option but to be true. On the other hand, if I said it's going to rain today and it's not going to rain today, then it's definitely going to be false. Assuming, of course, that everybody agrees what it is going to rain today means. So anyway, uh, if you or two statements which are complements of each other, you are going to get true or one. If you and them, you are definitely going to get zero always. So these are the useful laws of Boolean algebra, which are used to simplify Boolean functions and in many other ways. Now we are talking about electronics, right? Not about algebra so much. So we are going to talk about what happens in electronic circuits. Now these two things that we have been talking about, true or false, which we have been denoting by one or zero, in electronic circuits, they are often represent or they are always represented by uh, voltage levels. Often, but not always, true is represented by a large voltage. Now, large, of course, here is relative. Here, large means around 5 volts and false by a small voltage, which is around 0 volts. Now, by the way, it's not 5 volts precisely for true and 0 volts precisely for false. In most situations, there's a range. The range depends on the particular circuit implementation you have in mind. But in many cases, let's say something like 5 to 3 volts would be true and 0 to 2 volts would be false. Notice that there is a gap of 1 volt between the two possibilities and that gap is very important. Because of this gap, it is rather unlikely that small fluctuations will drive something which should be true to an error, to false. If you change, if it's because of circuit, uh, instabilities or some other problems, a 5 volt output from at a point changes to say 4.8 or even a 3.7 is still true. On the other hand, if uh, you change a 0 to 0 0.7 or 1.2 is still false. You would need a very large fluctuation in order for what should be a true. Read incorrectly as false. This is one of the advantages of using digital electronics, errors are easier to eliminate and once they occur, and sometimes they do occur, they are easier to control and sometimes uh, even correct for. Error correction is a big, big topic in digital electronics, but that's too advanced for us for the time being. We are not really going to go there. Now, in digital electronics, the basic Boolean functions are represented by what are called gates. So, these are Circuits which take inputs and produce outputs. The AND gate is denoted like this. So this is a two input AND gate. Of course, you could do an AND with more than two inputs. Where if you had an AND with say 10 inputs, that will give you an output of high only if all the inputs were high. And there you would have to put in 10 wires coming in into this symbol. That would look a bit nasty, but usually what you do is extend the base here and then draw the 10 wires to that. Keep the basic gate looking the same size. That's simply for aesthetics. It would look very crazy if you had a huge gate like this. So that's your AND gate symbol. Of course, the circuit inside is quite different. We are going to give a peek as to what an AND gate circuit could be like. That's not the circuits that are actually used in real electronics. Because basically you need to have other special protections built in. But we will show you an electronic circuit made out of diodes, which will implement the AND gate. Similarly, the OR gate is symboled like this. There's a curved line here, two curved lines here, two inputs, one output. Again, this is a two input OR gate, could be more. The NOT gate, on the other hand, always has one input. So that's always fixed there and one output. So the NOT gate is essentially shown this way. Frankly speaking, the NOT is really this 
circle in the front. The triangle behind is really our standard old symbol for an amplifier. A NOT gate always has an amplifier at the heart of the thing. And moreover, if you just drew a circle somewhere in the middle of the circuit, it would be easy to miss it. So we have decided to put the triangle always and put a circle after that to show that we have a NOT gate. Now, these three gates and or a not form a universal set. Well, that's really a statement of Boolean algebra, not from electronics. All Boolean functions can be represented by these three gates and their combinations. Or at the algebra level, all, all functions can be represented by combining the basic functions and or and not. Well, here three gates are universal, but on the other hand, the NAND gate alone is universal. By the way, so is NOR. Just to show that, notice this is what the NAND gate really is, right? It's basically two inputs. I'm just dealing with two inputs right now. Two inputs. The AND for the symbol has a circle in the front, which remember is really the NOT gate. So AND followed by a NOT. X, Y, bar. The one important thing is De Morgan's theorem tells us that x bar plus y bar is the same as x y bar. So that's instead of doing an and of x and y first and then complementing it. If it complemented x and y first, which are what these bubbles stand for, followed by ORing them, x bar or y bar, you would get the same result. So this and this are both representations of the NAND gate. Usually we use the one on the left, but the one on the right is an equally good representation of the NAND gate. Now, once we have that under our belt, it's easy to see that we can form the various AND, OR, and NOT gates from just a NAND gate or multiple NAND gates. How do you get NOT from NAND? That's simple. Okay, that's one rule. One more rule of Boolean algebra that we missed talking about. What is A and A and what is A or A? A and A, well, that's true only if both A is true and A is true. And false and A is false and A is false. That of course means that A and A is the same as A. A or A is also exactly the same as A because it's going to be true when A is true and false when A is false. So, when you create not from land, what you do is you feed the same input to x to both the inputs of the land. So what you are doing is x and x whole bar and x and x being x, you just get x bar. So that's a not from a single NAND gate. How do you get an AND from a NAND? Simple. All you do is just take the output from a single NAND gate, put a NOT gate after that and the NOT gate you can make out of the NAND gate. So this gives you x, y bar. This gives you the bar of that, which of course is x, y. Remember, if you complement a Boolean function twice, you get the same Boolean function back. If you complement the Boolean variable twice, you get the same Boolean variable back. Now, how do you get an OR gate from a NAND gate? Straightforward. Remember, a NAND gate is the same as a OR gate with two inputs complemented. So, if you first complement the two inputs x and y, putting them through two NOT gates, which you can build as stated using NAND gates, and then pass it through a NAND gate, the two complementations are going to cancel each other out and you are going to get OR. So you can get NOT AND and OR from NANDs alone. Very similarly, you can show that you can get them from NOR alone. And that says that the NAND gate is universal because any circuit that you can think about can be built using AND, OR and NOT gates and any such circuit can be then built using NAND gates. Now of course what you could do is make an AND or NOT implementation of that circuit and then change each of the gates by using these NAND equivalents. But there happens to be a cleverer by which I mean a more efficient way of doing this. Indeed, this method with a slight modification also works for the other universal gate. That is, 
construction of a Boolean circuit using NOR gates only. It is easier to explain this method by an example. So that is exactly what I am going to do. But the basic idea here is the following. We are going to exploit this equivalence. This is of course nothing but De Morgan's theorem that we have seen a while ago. A NAND gate is exactly equivalent to an OR gate with both inputs complemented, which is just a circuit way of saying AB whole bar is the same as A bar plus B bar. Similarly, a NOR gate A plus B whole bar is exactly equivalent to an AND gate with both inputs complemented. So, A bar plus B bar, which is of course the same as Sorry, a bar times dot b bar. That's a mistake here. It should be a bar dot b bar. We are going to essentially use this. Let me illustrate how this works. First, for a NAND gate only construction, we want to construct a Boolean circuit which will implement this particular Boolean function a plus b bar c bar plus a bar b c. Why I have chosen this particular function is not really very important right now. But for the time being, what I am going to assume is that I have access to multi-input gates. So I will not worry about the number of inputs a particular gate can have. Here, of course, the maximum that we have is a three input scenario to construct a bar b c. Also, the final OR gate for a OR b bar c bar or a bar b c also has to be a 3 input OR gate. We are going to assume those are available to us. Of course, sometimes because of constraints in the laboratory, for example, you may be forced to use only 2 input gates. That would complicate the construction a bit, but not really by much. So the first thing we do is construct a Boolean circuit that is going to give me this particular output simply using AND, OR and NOT gates. So this is the circuit that will do that. Note that this particular OR gate gets an input which is A from here. So it does get an input A. The other two inputs can be found as follows. This particular AND gate is getting B bar and C bar. So it's actually getting putting out B bar C bar, which is the input to the OR gate here. And this third AND gate, this is a three input AND gate. It gets the input B, the input C, and the input A bar. Now notice one thing. There are several places in this diagram where the wires have to cross. Now, in a Boolean circuit, there would be many, many wires. And in most Boolean circuits, those wires would cross a lot of times. Because this is very common in Boolean circuits and less common in analog circuits, we have a convention which is usually followed in these two disciplines. In the case of analog circuits, when you want to show that two wires are crossing, you use this. This implies that this wire is not connected to this one, it's just crossing over or under this one. On the other hand, if you want to draw it like this, this is a connection. Of course, sometimes even in analog circuits, to just to be sure or just to make it very clear, people do put a marker here to show that there is a connection. But the convention mostly followed in analog circuits is if two wires cross, they are connected. If you want to imply that they are not connected, you will have to show a bend in the wire, which essentially implies that one wire is going above or under the other. They are not really joined together. So this is the scenario for analog circuits. For digital circuits, on the other hand, the scenario is different. There are usually so many wires in a digital circuit that having to cross over every time you want to cross over is very, very bothersome. So people don't use that. What people do is this convention that if two wires just cross without uh, any further marker, then these two wires are supposed to be disconnected from each other. They're just, they're just crossing simply because 
it would be very difficult to draw the circuit otherwise. On the other hand, if you want to show that this wire, for example, and this one is joined, then at the junction you will have to put a marker. So this marker here shows that this wire is joined to this one. However, this middle wire is not joined to this middle wire, and this bottom wire is not joined to any one of these wires, at least the way we have drawn it. Notice that that's exactly the convention we are following here. This wire is starting on this other wire, so it might seem a bit of an overkill to put a junction there. After all, there is nothing to cross over here. However, the convention is whenever you have a connection, you have to show it. That's why we are using junction symbols here. On the other hand, this wire is actually crossing the input wires from B and C. And it's not connected to either of them. That's what this crossing without any further marker means. Okay, now that that is done, let us get down to the job of actually constructing this circuit using NAND gates only. And for this, I'm going to remind you once again, uh, an OR gate with its inputs complemented is actually a NAND gate. So what I'm going to do is start from the OR gate at the end and put circles on the input, which essentially signifies that the inputs are complemented or inverted. But now you can't simply do that, right? You have to compensate for it somehow. So the way to compensate this is that you have to invert a again. So two knots cancel each other out. That's exactly what we are using here. You want to cancel out this knot, you have to put a knot here. You go back this wire and put a knot on this AND gate. And actually you are done. Let me point out that this is a NAND gate, a 3 input NAND gate. This AND with its input complemented has become a NAND gate. This AND2 is a NAND gate. Now there are 4 NOT gates which you can easily construct using NAND gates with both inputs joined together. So this actually gives us the following NAND only construction rather trivially. Notice that this is actually a NAND gate which we have just changed the symbol here and shown this as a formal NAND gate. Similarly, these two what used to be ANDs have become NANDs and the three NOT gates which were there originally along with this other NOT gate which we had to bring in to compensate for this additional complementation that I had done, all the four have been implemented using just single two input NAND gates just by sending the same input to both the inputs. So this is a complete NAND only construction of this particular Boolean function. Now, how would we go and construct this using NOR gates only? We will use the same idea, just in reverse. That is, instead of using complemented input OR gates to so stand in for NANDs, we are going to use complemented input AND gates to stand in for the NOR. But there is only one problem if we try to actually work out this same circuit, this same one, using NOR gates alone by following this procedure. You are starting with an OR gate, not an AND. Earlier, of course, you were starting with an OR gate, but there your aim was to get a NAND only construction, so complementing the inputs of the OR gate actually worked out fine. Here, on the other hand, you cannot complement the inputs and cancel them somewhere further down the line or further up the line to be more precise. But what you can definitely do is change this into a NOR gate but just by complementing its output. Of course, you can't just do that. You have to put a NOR gate 
after that so that these two actions cancel. Now what do you do next? Now you go backwards, take a look at this AND and realize that if you can complement the two inputs, you are done. But then you have to cancel these effects, but cancelling is easy. You already have a NOT gate here. So what you can do is just get rid of the NOT gate and that does takes care of the cancelling. Similarly here, get rid of the NOT gate. Here, complement all three inputs, get rid of this NOT gate or you could think of it this way that you really push this NOT gate all the way so that it's just sitting next to the input here. But you have to actually cancel this one. So you have to have a NOT gate here. You also have to have a NOT gate here. And finally, all you have to do is redraw this circuit so that these two, two input and three input gates respectively, do look like NOT gates. And, and the remaining NOT gates, there are still two remaining here have to be implemented using NOR gates alone just by shorting the two inputs of a NOR gate. And this is what you end up with. So these two have become NOR gates. I have just denoted them as proper NOR gates. This one already was a NOR gate. You need an extra NOT in the front. This is a NOR implementation of that. And these two NOT gates here, one I have drawn here, the other one I have just drawn here, simply because otherwise things would have been too cluttered up here. And this gives you a NOR only implementation of this Boolean circuit. So the rule is simple. Construct a Boolean circuit. If the final gate is an OR and you want a NAND only implementation, just complement its inputs, go backwards, cancel these complementations by introducing either extra NOT gates or cancelling any NOT gate which you have on the way back. And then keep on doing this until you reach the input state. With a NOR only implementation, the situation is exactly the same, except that if you already have an OR gate at the output, you have to complement this output and cancel it by putting an additional NOT gate after that. A very similar situation will arise if you have to make a NAND only construction of a circuit which ends with an AND gate. That is, the output is taken from an AND gate. Then, of course, you would complement this output and put an extra NOT gate after that. If you try to implement this particular circuit using the other strategy, that is, construct everything using AND or NOT gates first and then replace every one of these gates by their pure NAND equivalence or their pure NOT equivalence, as the case may be, you would usually end up with a much more complicated circuit which can sometimes be simplified by cancelling out two knots which are next to each other and so on. But this is a much more efficient way of doing this. So as we have seen, all Boolean functions can be written down as combinations of AND, OR and NOT functions and implemented in a circuit by using AND, OR and NOT gates or as we have just seen, using NAND gates alone or NOT gates alone. Now in practice, these gates come pre-built Multiple of number of them comes pre-built in integrated circuit chips and you can directly use those in your circuit implementations. However, it is quite nice to know exactly what is going on inside. So exactly how are these gates implemented? Okay, the word exactly is not really precise here. The implementations I'm going to talk about are very simple versions which will do the job. But let me warn you that if you were to actually design an integrated circuit using for implementing AND or and NOT gates or NAND gates or whatever, you would actually have to use slightly more complicated circuits simply because of various protections that you need to afford your circuit. But anyway, it's pretty easy to understand how the OR gate and the AND gate work using discrete components and that's what we are going to explain next. Um, this is the gate that we are going to talk about first. This is an OR gate which is made using just two diodes and a resistor. 
the inputs are a and b and the output is taken here well the output is taken across this register r that we have here now let us under, try to understand how this works notice that if both a and b are false that is in this case false means low voltage here low voltage is any voltage so low that the diodes cannot cut in say 0 volts or anything lower than 0.6 would actually do then both these diodes would be cut off no current will flow through either of the two diodes hence no current will flow through this resistance and therefore the output which is the voltage drop across the resistance will stay zero on the other hand if any one of these inputs is made high and for the time being let's say high is 5 volts so let's say i have made this input a or this input b 5 volts then what will happen is that the current is going to flow through that corresponding diode the diode which has been forward biased say if a is high b is low then d1 is forward biased d2 is still reverse biased so no current flows through d2 but current does flow through d1 and because this is a real diode, there will be a drop across the diode, it will not be zero, but it will be around 0 0.6 volts or so. So this current of course will flow through the resistance causing a voltage drop there. And how much voltage drop will occur across R? That's easy to figure out. A drop across D1 is around 0.6 volts, so you will get something around 4.4 volts here, which remember counts as high. So if either A or B is high, then either D1 or D2 is forward biased, that will drop around 0.6 volts, and you're going to get around 4.4 volts here. What is that you're going to get high output? If both A and B are high, both diodes go forward biased, the voltage here will be high again. If you were very particular about this, the voltage here will be slightly higher than the voltage in the previous two cases, simply because each of these diodes will be contributing to the current flowing through R now. So the current going through individual diodes will be smaller, which means the drop across the diodes will be slightly smaller. Of course, the statement that a forward bias diode drops 0 0.6 volts exactly is an approximate statement. The drop does depend on the current flowing through it. However, this nearly fixed at 0.6 volts. So, frankly, the voltage across the resistance in this case will again be pretty close to 4.4 volts if both A and B were high. But to summarize, if the output is going to be low only if both A and B are low, so that the diodes are both cut off. Otherwise, the output is going to be high. And notice this is where the importance of high not being exactly 5 volts is shown. Uh, the high here for the output is not 5, it's around 4.4 or so. Now, in a real circuit, you may want to boost it back to higher values simply because you don't want to keep on losing the voltage if you chain a lot of diodes together or a lot of OR gates together. So, basically, the real circuit will have further circuitry beyond this um, to protect the input against very huge currents, uh, to protect the output against these drops, a lot, at least reduce the drops a bit. But this is roughly how the OR gate works. The AND gate can also be built out of two diodes for two input AND gate. Notice here also, if you use more than two inputs, you would have to put in more, more than two diodes. A similar case for all AND gates, but the connection is slightly different. Notice that here, the resistance instead of being grounded is actually connected to your plus 5 volt source and the output is taken between this other end of the resistance and the ground. Now here, Again, understanding how this works is pretty easy. If any one of either A or B or both are grounded, that is, if A is 0 or B is 0 or both are 0, then at least one of the D1 or D2 or both will be forward biased. Remember, 5 volts is at this end, there's a resistance, then you have the diodes. So if these ends are at 0, then the diodes will be forward biased. Not necessarily both of them, but at least one of them. If that happens, current flows through the diode, that makes the voltage drop across the diode, that drives the voltage at the other end, which is what you are measuring, low. In fact, you can easily figure out what the voltage at the other end will be. After all, between the other end and the ground, remember, let's say A is grounded, so between the other end and the ground, there is just a diode D1. 
And so the voltage across the, the diode will be the voltage across a forward bias diode, which is around 0.6 volts. So the output will be around 0.6 volts. So if a, either A is grounded or B is grounded or both are grounded, the output is going to be around 0.6 volts, which counts as low. Not zero, but not zero volts, but 0.6 volts. That's low. On the other hand, if both A and B are forward biased, then there is no potential difference across two ends of the diode. No current will flow through the diodes. No drop will occur here. And so this point will be at the same voltage as the other end of the resistance, which is 5 volts. So if both inputs are 5 volts, the output will be 5 volts. This is how you implement an AND gate. Again, not how you do it in practical circuits, but how you can do it just to understand how AND gates work. NOT gates are simpler in the sense that they have only one input and one output, not multiple inputs. Unlike the AND and the OR gate, you cannot actually implement a NOT gate using diodes and resistors alone. For that, you have to go on to the next level. That is, you have to use a transistor. Actually, what you have to use is a familiar circuit, a transistor-based CE amplifier. That is exactly why there is an amplifier symbol as part of the logic symbol. So this is the circuit that you use to implement the NOT gate at the simplest possible level. Of course, real circuits are more complicated than this. This is just for understanding how the thing goes. But notice that there's one condition which is implemented here, which is RC, the resistance uh, which connects the bias battery, in this case, plus five volts, to the collector has to be bigger than beta Rb. Now, if you remember your biasing theory, you would realize this is exactly opposite the condition that we used for standard amplifiers. Because there, what we wanted was Rc has to be smaller than beta Rb, but quite a lot smaller, just to ensure that you do not drive the circuit into saturation. Here, what you really need is to drive the circuit into saturation. In fact, in an actual design, you will not put RC just barely bigger than beta RB. You will put it quite a bit bigger than beta RB so that there is no doubt that under the right conditions, the circuit will go into saturation. Here, if the input A is plus 5 volts, then the transistor is definitely driven into saturation. The point is, the current through this forward bias base emitter junction is large enough so that the RC current will be large and a large current through RC coupled with the value of RC which is large here will essentially ensure that you are driving uh, this end to nearly zero volts. So which means this end is going to go below the base and that's what causes saturation. So typically saturation occurs at a period when VC becomes smaller than VB, roughly around 0.7 volts again. So the output will be 0.7 volts or lower. So when the input is high, the output will be low. On the other hand, when the input is low, that is zero volts, there is no base current, no collector current, no drop across the RC. So the output will be plus five volts. So this is how a low input gives a high output and a high input gives a low output in this circuit. So this is, of course, what a NOT gate does. So far, we have been just looking at the basics of Boolean algebra and talking about how to implement Boolean algebra in a digital circuit, either in the form of abstract gates, which in real implementations can be built inside integrated circuit chips, or by using discrete circuit components like here. We will next talk about how to combine these to build more complicated circuits and more importantly, useful circuits. So that's the next lecture.